more and more people are making YouTube videos at home these days, and in doing so, they generally need some, somewhere to film, uh, like a little home studio. And uh, one of the most important things to get right with this studio is lighting, as it tells people that your video has good production values and that it's worth watching. Trouble is, lighting is often quite expensive, especially for newcomers. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make some very low-cost studio lights that can take a boring old lighting setup like this and turn it into this. Quite an improvement. Now, one of the features of the lights is that they have three different colour temperatures. So you can go from warm white all the way up to really cool white, which is a good way of adding um, dynamics to your scene because it gives a real three-dimensional effect if some of it is lit by a, a warm light and others are lit by a cool white. And uh, of course, colour accuracy, you know me, it's paramount. So these are using really good quality LEDs that produce accurate and lifelike colour, which is something that budget LED lights don't do. So this is a good way of getting really good quality for not much money. Um, we're going to be doing them as economy of scale, so we're going to make five of them at once um, so that uh, we can get a good lighting setup for not too much time and not much money at all. So without further ado, let's get to it. By the way, if you like my projects and want to support what I do here on YouTube, please consider supporting the channel through Patreon. Patrons get access to several, dare I say it, perks, including free access to all project blueprints and source files. Visit patreon.com slash DIYperks for more information and many thanks for your support. So before we start construction, I'll give you a quick overview of the finished lights. As you can see, each light is shaped like a half cylinder for maximum diffusion, which makes them very easy on the eyes as the light is very soft. They can be mounted onto walls directly, which is helpful if you don't have any light stands or if you want to use the lights for general home lighting. They can also be joined together to make a giant softbox, which is in itself a great use case as it's significantly thinner than a bought one, which makes them perfect for use in small studios. So the first task in making them is to cut down a sheet of aluminium into strips to use as the main supporting back panels for the lights. We're using aluminium here as it's not only cheap and easy to work with, but it's also a good conductor of heat, so it will keep the LEDs cooler by dispersing excess heat into the surrounding air. Now I've borrowed a jigsaw for this job as it slices through the 1mm thick sheet like butter, and I kept it straight by running it along the edge of a piece of wood. To clean up the edges afterwards, you could use a deburring tool, but if you don't have one, you could just use a blade like I did. Now a good size to cut these into is 80 cm by 14 cm, as it keeps the material costs lower and also ensures that the final lights aren't too big and bulky. Feel free to scale it up or down however to your needs, but you will have to disregard any subsequent measurements I give out. So once they're all cut, we can stack them together and drill four holes along each edge. If any of them have jagged edges, you can try manually twisting a much larger drill bit over them to clean them up. So with that done, we now need plenty of rivet nuts. These can be fitted onto the end of a nut rivet tool, pushed through the holes we just made, and then the tool can be used to clamp them to the aluminium. This is like my new favourite tool, um, and you can find a link to it in the description. So this gives us plenty of mounting nuts, which we'll later be using to attach to some important structural strips. More on that later though. So before moving on to the next step, we also need to drill two holes at the top and bottom of each sheet, which will later be used to mount some semicircular support arches. We also need to follow these up with a small central hole at the top and bottom for a small screw to be bolted through to act as a power ground anchor point, which I'll again be covering in more detail in just a minute. So with that, it's time to add the light source, and it will come as no surprise to those of you who are familiar with the channel to find that it's in the form of, you guessed it, LED strips. As I usually recommend, it's important not to skimp out on these, as cheap ones often have really bad colour rendition. Blech. 
Now I really recommend that you go with photography grade strips, even if you only want to use the final lights for general home lighting. So I've put some Amazon and eBay links to the ones I personally recommend in the video's description. These are new to the market and better than everything that I've used in the past. They're still pretty low cost, but are bright and have a colour rendering index of 95, which is close to a perfect score of 100. But the best part is that they do this without faking it, so the white point is right in the middle, rather than shifted towards magenta or red. As usual, the company that makes them does ship from China, so you might want to order them straight away so that you don't have to wait for them to arrive when you want to start working on this project. So to achieve the wide range of colour temperatures I showed you earlier, we'll need a set of three different colour temperature strips. The first and primary one is a daylight matched strip, which is pretty much what you'd consider as pure white. To stretch its tone and make it appear warmer or cooler, however, we also need to add a strip of warm white and a strip of ice blue. It's important to note that this ice blue strip isn't actually a spike of blue light as it appears, but is instead a white LED heavily shifted to the blue end of the spectrum, meaning that there are some other tones mixed in there like green and a tiny bit of yellow. This makes it very useful for mixing with the primary daylight match strip to make sky blue, which is superb for adding freshness to your lighting setup, and this is something that's very hard to achieve otherwise. So before sticking on the LEDs, any protective film on the aluminium can be peeled away, which until this point has kept the surface clean and free from fingerprints, which should help the LEDs to stick down more reliably. This is fairly straightforward, but before doing it you need to make sure that you add a layer of insulating electrical tape to the top and bottom to prevent any short circuits when we wire them up. Each strip needs to be cut in between the copper pads so that it's about 75cm long, and the first one can be stuck to the aluminium just off centre. Once two of these have been added, and in my case it was the daylight match strips I added first, we can do the same with the ice blue strip and then the warm white strips. The idea here is to have two daylight match strips in the middle, followed by two ice blue strips and then two warm white strips. To ensure that they never peel away, it's a good idea to add some dabs of hot glue to their edges every 15cm or so. Once they've been added to all of the aluminium backs, we're almost ready to wire them up. Before we do this however, we need to make some semicircular supports, which can be made out of a sheet of low density PVC plastic. This stuff is used for sign making and is fairly inexpensive. I have access to a CNC router, so I just lazily left it to cut them out for me, yay! <laughs> but to make these with basic tools, it's almost as easy. So to do this, you can first mark out a semicircle with a 7cm radius, and carefully cut it out with a coping saw. We need to make some vents in it too, to allow air to circulate, so we can drill 6 holes in it like so, and join the topmost two together with the coping saw. And finally, we can drill 3 holes to mount the components in. See, who needs a CNC? Now each light needs two of these semicircles, and the three component holes on the second one need to be heavily countersunk for the brightness knobs to later fit into. A force and a bit would work great for doing this. So to wire these up, we'll first need a set of three power sockets. These can simply be screwed into the holes like so, and we need to wire them up in parallel. So we can measure out a length of red wire, and expose sections of it with some wire cutters, and solder these to the positive tabs on the power sockets, which are the slightly shorter of the two tabs. The same can be done with the black wire, only this time hooking it up to the slightly longer negative tabs. This whole semicircle can then be attached to the aluminium by screwing into it with self-tapping screws through those holes we made earlier. Now the negative wire needs to be bent into a circle and soldered up to make it stiff so that it can be slid onto that small screw we added earlier and clamped down with a nut. This grounds the aluminium, allowing us to use it as the negative conductor for the LED dimmers in just a moment. The red wire on the other hand can have various sections of it exposed and then these can be soldered to the positive tabs on each of the LED strips like so. 
With the power inputs now sorted, we now need to work on the control side so that we can adjust the brightness of each set of colour temperature strips, for which we'll need three LED dimmers. These work by rapidly turning on and off, but they operate at such a rapid rate, 10 kHz in fact, that the flickering is imperceptible to the eye and is instead perceived as lower brightness. It's not visible to cameras either so long as the shutter speed is below 1 1000th of a second. These can be mounted onto the other semicircle like so, and then wired up to the LED strips. This is fairly straightforward, but as usual with circuits, it's better to work off a diagram, so I've included one in the video's description. Once this has been done, some knobs can be added, and then a 12 volt power adapter can be plugged into any one of the three power sockets, after which the dimmers should be able to control each of the colour sets individually. As you can see they're very bright, but as a result they are difficult to look at directly and they leave strong afterglows in your eyes even if you glance at them only briefly. This makes them uncomfortable to use, so we need to diffuse them with a diffusion sheet. This stuff is inexpensive and spreads the light over its entire surface, making it an order of magnitude easier on the eyes. It doesn't block any light, it just spreads it out. The problem with this sheet though is that it's really flimsy and floppy, so we need to find a way to give it some strength. To do this we can use some medium thickness acetate. As you can see I've already cut mine down to match the height of the lights, so the next step is to carefully score a very shallow fold mark along one side, being careful not to cut all the way through. Now we can get a piece of paper that matches the length of the arch on the semicircle and use it to mark where a second fold line can go, which can also be very lightly scored. Finally, about 2cm up from this second mark, we can trim it off completely, making it the perfect size for fitting over the lights. So to attach this in place we're going to use two strips of low density PVC plastic, the same stuff in fact that was used for making the semicircles. Now I've drilled holes along their lengths, matching the holes in the aluminium, which also need to be mirrored on the acetate as well. With that done for both sides, we can now bend the acetate along the marked grooves. So long as the marks are on the outside of the bends, it should fold neatly along them without splitting. Now one side can be placed on the back of the aluminium with one of the PVC strips on top and screwed in place. I'm using countersink M4 screws here as they will pull into the PVC and become flush with its surface. So before screwing down the other side we need to add the diffusion sheet which first needs to be cut down to match the inside area of the acetate. In fact you need to make this about 3mm thinner overall so that it doesn't crease as it's folded around. Once this is in place the acetate can be folded over and the other strip can be used to clamp it against the aluminium again using countersink screws to hold it in place. To finish things off I added some PVC arches, which clamp over the acetate once screwed down. I then trimmed off any overlapping acetate. Now adding this acetate covering not only protects the LEDs and diffuses the light, but it also makes the entire light rigid and unbendable, which is excellent considering they weigh only 700 grams. Once you've finished the others they can be used to great effect for either home lighting or studio lighting. To mount them onto a wall you can simply use a couple of nails, but if you want to mount them on a light stand it's just a case of making a quick frame out of aluminium angles to which they can be screwed. This is also why there's three power sockets on each light, as it allows them to be daisy chained together from just one power supply. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, if you want to make some of these lights yourself, which I hope you do because they are really useful, uh, you can find all of the links to the stuff needed to make them in the description as well as a link to my Patreon account and many thanks if you decide to support me on there. Um, but other than that, I'm Matt, you've been watching DIY Perks and I hope I see you next time. Goodbye for now.